I try to clarify the mission and the vision all the time. This is the mission, the reason why we are here and we fight for it. Because the startup, we always have to face a lot of like obstacles and it's really tough. So we need to know the reason and the purpose, why we are here and why we cost a lot and why we have to, you know, go through a lot of like difficulties and then trying to let everyone understand the reason and the purpose. This is the really beginning part. After this, it's not so difficult. Just we trying to compromise uh, each other and try to understand each other and try to understand their country and culture. And then it actually gives us a lot of uh, more deep strength. Konnichiwa, minasan. Business is successful Japan no podcast e yokoso. Hello everyone and welcome to the Business Success Japan podcast. This is your host, Lydia Buechelman. This podcast is made for those who want to develop or strengthen the communication skills, cultural savvy, insights into current trends and conditions, and mindsets that are essential in a Japanese business environment. The helpful practical suggestions and engaging insights offered here provide listeners with the in-depth cultural context needed to achieve their own version of success while collaborating with Japanese counterparts. In today's episode, I'm excited to share a conversation that I got to have with Manabu Goto. Manabu is the founder of HELT, which created a unique conversation platform that I used extensively during the pandemic called SAIL. Manabu is a Japanese native and world traveler whose mission is to create a more inclusive world. We'll hear much more about Manabu's background and his company during the interview, so be sure to stick around to learn more. You definitely won't want to miss it. Also, just have one more note before we officially get into today's interview. If you're enjoying the podcast and want to keep the content flowing, please consider doing one of three things. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow or subscribe on whatever platform you're using and consider leaving a review as well. This helps the podcast reach new listeners who could benefit from the information shared here. If you have a favorite episode, please go ahead and share it with a friend or colleague who you think would enjoy it. And if you would like to help make sure that I stay well caffeinated enough to keep putting together these episodes, please consider offering financial support at the podcast's new coffee page. You can find the link to do so in the description of the episode. So thank you so much in advance, and let's get into today's conversation. Very nice to meet you, everyone.、Uh, my name is Manavu Koto from Chiba Prefecture. Now I am Actually, I built the corporation startup company named Healthy, and I'm going to talk about what we do from now on. Great. So, can you tell us a little bit about what your history with Japan is? I was born and raised in Chiba Prefecture, and then there, because of my mom, I had a life like back and forth like, time between Japan and the US.、Uh, in the US, which was the Sarasota, Florida, which is a really small city. And then there, she is、uh, still like a photographer and taking a picture of like circus people. So I needed to go with her like during her trip. And then, there, yes, that's all. And then the,、uh, I spent my time in Japan until the high school. I played baseball. And after graduating from high school, I went to the university. And that time,、uh, I had a chance to go to the United States again for a year. And then the next year, I went to the India for a year as well. Yeah, that's my life. Great. So, what made you decide to return to Japan for your career instead of the US or India? Yes, because the more I travel a lot, like abroad and studying my major international business in the US and India, the more I deeply know the, the, how wonderful Japan is and I wanted to know more about Japan. So, I decided to come back to Japan. And first of all, like,、uh, I decided to work in the corporation's entity. In Japan, which is the, one of the biggest IT corporations, and I'm trying to get more experience. And then in the future, I want you to start my business. Yeah, that's the reason why I came back. So, what motivated you to want to start your own business instead of working in another company that was already established? Yes, while I was studying my major in India, I saw so many people, like people were so different from Japan. Like, I saw so many people live hand to mouth as well. And then that was kind of really big shock to me. And then that moment, I was still a student, but、uh, I had the feeling like a big compost that I really wanted to、uh, contribute to society by 
uh, my own project. That's the reason why like, I, I decided to start my own corporations. Yes. So did you have a hard time finding a company that aligned with what you wanted to do? Just, did you just have a very clear idea of the type of company you wanted to make? At the beginning of this startup period, like I didn't have any actually idea, but uh, I had only one idea and then the will, probably I could say, is that I really want to contribute to society, which is especially to the developing countries because I lived in India for a year and then yes, I realized yeah, that especially like education mm-hmm. is really important and then underlying problems they had were always like related to education. So that was only one purpose that in my mind, uh, the, something like related to my business idea. So then can you tell us a little bit more about your company and what it does? Our company is Healthy, and then we mainly uh, develop the product named Cell. The Cell is uh, actually a matching platform uh, between the international people who are a big fan of Japan and also learning Japanese and uh, Japanese active senior citizens. And then uh, we, our product match this, both of them, and then let them have a conversation in Japanese for 25 minutes. So in Japan now, we have really big, serious problem, which is the aging society. And then there are a lot of like senior citizens, but they are really experienced ones. They know a lot of like knowledge. So I want them to pass down what they've learned and knowledge and experience on the next generation. On the other hand, international people can learn not only Japanese language, but also some Japanese culture, history, and our background as well. So probably I really want to bring the value, the, the this coexistence and then the diversity, something, this kind of the concept between them. Yeah. Great. So I was lucky enough to be able to use the app mostly during the pandemic when I was back in the States because I didn't have a chance to use Japanese, obviously, in West Michigan. So that turned out to be a really great resource for me. But just for people who aren't familiar with the app, logistically, how does it work? How do you get volunteers? And then how do people join the app and participate in it? Yeah, uh, mainly like we get like Japanese users from a municipality project because now we implement a service to the Japanese government office, such as Kanago Prefecture, Toyoda City, and now like Kyushu City, something like this, Kita Kyushu City. And then we get a lot of like user from them because the Japanese government, the interest we have and the Japanese government is kind of really similar because Japanese government trying to deduce the cost of the insurance from senior citizens because we have a lot of like senior citizens. So after we implement our service and then let them have opportunity to communicate with others and participate in the social activity, probably it's not like a physical health, but it's more like a mental health. And then we are now like doing some research together with Tokyo University and trying to measure it, how they can change uh, their mind and then the health score after, before and after using our service. So we try to expand with that way. Also, of course, like we do some marketing as well to the 2C business model and also work with the corporation, just like fitness center and the insurance company as well. This is the way how we get the user from Japanese side. And then on the other hand, the international side, uh, we do some uh, really general uh, web marketing, like through the SNS and doing some event. And then uh, we get users from both sides. And then our system is like let senior citizens open their available schedule. And then international people will apply for this schedule. And then the system will automatically match them. And then they just wait their conversation at that time and they open the app and they start the conversation it's really simple uh, logic and then the matching algorithm great so for people who want to practice japanese what costs are involved in joining we provide the price between the five us dollars to the 15 us dollars it depends on the gdp per country and then the example uh, if the user is from Myanmar, the cost is a bit cheap. And then on the other hand, if the user is from, let's say, the Germany, the cost is around like 15 US dollars. And then they can use our service uh, for a month and no limited. They can have a conversation as much as they want with this cost. 
Great. Yeah, I was wondering about that because when I was on the app, it was about $10 per month, which was obviously very affordable for me, but I, I knew that there were a lot of people from countries all over the world. So I was wondering if the costs changed based on the country. And it's great to hear that you've been able to figure that out as well. So then what are some other parts of your company? What else does your company do? Actually, now we try to analyze the conversation data. Of course, it's optional. And then we get permission from senior citizens because uh, the, one of the problems we face related to the Asian society is the dementia. Because like we will have like over 7 million uh, patients of like dementia in the future in Japan. And then that costs a lot of uh, insurance system in Japan. So if it's the, the, the hypothesis or the assumption is kind of quite simple the like the more senior citizens talk with somebody probably we can activate their brain the assumption is super simple and then this counterpart is the international people and then we do this research with the tokyo university right now and then we get data gradually right now so if we can prove uh, the cell can walk and improve a little bit of uh, dementia prevents them from the dementia we can actually go to the some healthcare industry in the future. That's what we do right now. And on the other hand, international market, the we do actually we will start the crossover recommend business starting from first uh, of October, because now we have a user just like uh, the one from uh, Taiwan. She already talked with Japanese people over two hundred times. We got data as well, so we can actually introduce her to the Japanese corporations. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to expand our business model from uh, communication and then conversation, which is sell to the healthcare and decrement business. That's what we do. Great. So can you tell me a little bit more about the people who work in your company? We mainly, we got mainly like a uh, staff from Japan, but at the same time, we got staff from Italy, US, China, France, and so on. Uh, I try to mix uh, a lot of like diverse people into our team because our vision is like breaking down the barriers between the people and nation and the color and then blah blah. So that time, if we go just discussing like within just Japanese, oh, we go global and then uh, we're trying to be like break down this kind of barriers. It's really ironic, I think. That's the reason why I try to integrate a lot of the knowledge and then the people into our team. So our Board of directors also uh, composed like of the people from China and then France and Japan. So even if it's a little bit like a painstaking to have a discussion sometimes because we all have a different type of idea and way of thinking. But like at the end, the idea and then the strategy came out of this really painstaking discussion. It's really beautiful. Like it's really strong and then the really durable idea that we can have at the end of the day. And how do you go about managing such a diverse group of people in one company? Because a buzzword is having culture fit or having people who fit into the company rather than trying to intentionally create a team that is inherently very diverse. I try to clarify the mission and the vision all the time. The just This is the mission, the reason why we are here and we fight for it because the startup, we always have to face a lot of like obstacles and challenging and it's really tough. So we need to know the reason and then the purpose, why we are here and why we cost a lot and why we have to, you know, go through a lot of like difficulties and then trying to let everyone understand the reason and the purpose. This is the really beginning part. And then after this, it's not so difficult. Just we try to compromise uh, each other and try to understand each other and try to understand their country and culture. And then it actually give us, gives us a lot of uh, more deep strength. So, so far, we are, our team is not so big, around like 30 people. So I still can manage it. We sometimes have like a workshop, discuss and try to open their thought and um, yeah, it still works. So how do you plan to grow the business itself? Because as you said, right now, it's a very manageable group of people. But if you're hoping to expand operations, how do you think that will work for your company as a Japanese company, but also 
being so cross-cultural? So far, like, I am the one who found this cooperation and I can control, like, everything. But the in the future, within two years, I need to hire a CEO the, who specializes in the management, uh, not only in Japan, but to the globe. Because I know how to start from the zero to one and other stuff. Now I've been through it, but I don't know honestly like how to expand and grow this business from one to hundred, hundred to thousand. So this is the the new role, and then the, I understand I'm not good at this kind of uh, development. So the first of all, I need really qualified people in our team, much qualified than me, and I need to accept because my company is just like my baby. So I need to, you know, always uh, taking care of my company. And I really want to, if I want to be a king all the time and then hire somebody, I don't say like lower than me, but uh, someone, the junior stuff, like probably I shouldn't do it anymore from this period of time. I need to hire more qualified people and how to, I should think of how to build really strong team. That's my core theme right now. I have. Yeah, it's great that you're being so intentional about how you're approaching uh, building a team, but how do you decide that somebody is a good fit for your company? You mentioned being aligned with the vision, having a diverse viewpoint, but is there anything else that makes somebody a good fit in your type of company? Of course, like we fundraise and then we need profit, but at the same time, we have to think of this kind of contribution at the same time, not only like pursuing the financial goal, but at the same time, uh, we have to contribute to society. This is like two like elements are really important in our company. So whenever I look for the people in our team, actually like a new one, I see the balance between these two like elements. Like of course, like you have to you're really responsible for the financial goal. At the same time, not only this, you have to of course like contribute to society and then you have to do something good. But like at the same time, of course like in this business model, there are a lot of people come to us. They are mainly like coming from the background of like contribution that's something uh, social worker and then the welfare, blah, blah. But uh, just I always try to carefully see this person has two point of view, these two sides. So then you mentioned that your company involves both fundraising and making a profit. So how do you create a company in a in Japan that is able to do both of those things just on a logistic level? What does that process look like for anybody who might be hoping to start a more mission-driven company like yours? We need to switch some kind of the mask all the time. If we talk with somebody who is really pursuing the financial goal, just like the investor, because they always check like KPI and then the, how much we earn money, the sales and then the profit and everything. We need to speak their language, that, which is really important. And on the other hand, there are a lot of like people, especially like users and then some stakeholders and the stuff. They are not only like just looking for the profit. Actually, they want us to contribute to society. At that time, we need to switch our mask and then just different version of ourselves and then the talking with their language, talking with them in their language. So this kind of thing is really important. And then the, the keep us keep going, like, you know, the help us to develop like a both side. The leader should have this kind of uh, point of view. That's what I believe. And just starting your company from zero, probably as alone at first, I assume, um, did you encounter any obstacles that you found surprising anything you weren't expecting when you started out they're a little like surprising during this the process of this entrepreneur life i had actually uh, got a lot of like difficulties and then the, i was in the pickle so many times and then the, it was really surprising whenever i faced this kind of situation just someone uh, gave me a hand and then especially the first investor named like Claude Lies from France. Uh, he invested me the first time and then he is not only like investing, but like I was born raising like single mom family. So he told me a lot of stuff like how to be a good man and how to savor the every and uh, each moment of the life, not only the business. So they actually really raised me, not only the business person, but also as 
a human being and a person itself. So yes, I got a little bit like a problem, but like a lot of people help me out. That's great. I'm glad that you were able to find the people you needed when you needed them. <laughs> that makes all the difference. So going back to your background, could you tell us a little bit more about like, what it's like living as a invisible minority in Japan? I was born and raised uh, in Chiba Prefecture, as I said, and then the, the area, the especially like my friends, they all had actually the parents. And then whenever they finished their school and went back home, their mothers always like waited for them. And then they gave them like snack and stuff. And then on the weekend, whenever they went to the baseball game, the parents watched them playing baseball. That's what went on in my uh, hometown. But like to me, it was totally different. As I said, my mom uh, is a photographer and she always traveled like the half of the year. She traveled somewhere to US, China, Europe, like and everywhere. And I couldn't spend much time with her. So my basically like the grandparents like raised me and took care of me. So I really felt the unfair uh, to my family. And but uh, I try to uh, digest the situation I was in. And also the I really had and thought this is my life stigma until I was 20. But I finally like realized actually she gave me a lot of like opportunity to let me have the interest toward the world and then the different culture. So even if like the being minority is really tough, but if we can change the point of view, how we look at ourselves and how to perceive uh, ourselves, actually we can turn our weakness and stigma into the strength. That's what I realized around these five years. So are there any other things that you think could be done in Japan through technology that would help create a more inclusive and equitable society? To me, especially, I, was, I am engaged in the, this healthcare and the senior citizens industry. So actually, I discovered so many things that we can do more because Japan is totally different from, let's say, the Singapore. Singapore, like, digitalized, like, everything. The, all the process and procedure in the government office, but the Japan is so out of date. Like they do still a lot of things on the paper, and then it's really taking a long time to submit everything. So Japan still has a lot of like room for improvement in terms of uh, this digitalization and other stuff. So by doing this, we can solve a lot of like problem, like let some disabled people work in the corporation and then this VR and then everything. This is like uh, too much like, I mean, the, yeah, actually we can do these kind of things. There are a lot of like issues in the social welfare uh, industry and also the government office stuff as well uh, in terms of especially the digitization part. Or what are some common barriers that you see in Japan that make it difficult for more people to be included in the society? You mentioned disability, but are there any other factors? Age as well. Yes, not only like disabled people and then the this kind of a minority, but like basically like a Japanese society uh, looking at the young people or some people who want to do something bigger and then the different. Actually, they take them as a maverick or something. Let's say uh, to me as well, I started my corporation after just graduate from university. Like technically, I worked in the NTT for a year and quit it and then started my company. And everyone says, uh, it's no way like you shouldn't do it because at least you should work in the corporation for three years. That's the the standard of Japan. So I, I was really scared and I really hesitated to start my business as well. But uh, I didn't regret right now. So what I want to say here is that the really difficult part of the Japan, not only to the minority, is that the society is not like side with us whenever we challenge something new and which will trigger some uh, stance of Japan that they don't include uh, someone different as well. So by especially our project, by doing our uh, sale project and expand our business, we're trying to create inclusive society 
by letting them have a conversation because we can believe and feel later on, even if like you were different, still okay. That's why I thought while traveling abroad as well. So I really want to convey this kind of idea to the society as well. I know that you're still gathering data and researching the issue, but do you have any stories from Japanese users that this system has been beneficial to them? You already mentioned that there are people who have vastly improved their Japanese by using the program as well, but anything on the other end you've heard? Yeah, the really touching story I've heard from the one of the users is that generally speaking, not all of them, but like some of them, some of like senior citizens have a little bit like a small stigma, I mean, the prejudice and bias toward people outside uh, outside of Japan, especially to the Asian people. The respect toward uh, international people is more like to the Western people, but to Asian people, I don't know why, but like they, some of them, really some of them uh, look down on them, but after they use our service and talk with the people from Asia, somehow uh, our service changed their way of thinking. And then actually they started to talk with Asian people who walk in the convenience store or someone stumble into the on the street. And then they emailed us their way of thinking and then the, the image of Asian people has been changed after using cell, which is really cool. And then I was really feeling happy so sometimes like prejudice and bias makes us socially blind. Like you are like this, you're America and you're Chinese, you're blah, blah, blah. But after talking with people directly, sometimes like all these prejudice bias are gone and then we can see the new world with no filter. So that's what I heard from one of the users. So an unforgettable feedback. Yeah, that's so great to hear because it's easy to assume that once people get older, they're less likely to change their mind, but it's never too late. <laughs> Don't give up on people if you think that they have some mindsets you you assume will never change. Everybody can change. <laughs> it's often just a matter of exposing and learning about the world. So do you have any examples of communication breakdowns in your own life that you think were due to differences in culture? I don't know, but like, because probably I live in Japan and then just only like, take a bit of thought of like Chinese people and then French people like Americans. So I don't feel and find any communication. I don't say that problem, but like this kind of situation. I try to cultivate new mana version of like Chinese version of mana in myself and then the French version of mana in myself. And I'm really enjoying this explanation right now. So sometimes these two different versions like have a conflict. But yet, this sometime led me to the new version of myself. So I try to make some chemistry within myself mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I can see that in myself, having lived outside of the States, there are some parts of myself that I want to change to be more similar to the other cultures that I've been exposed to. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that I'm just going to try to become a person of the culture that I happen to be in. So it's a little bit of a balance. (laughs) Yeah, so true. But I find uh, some communication style is so totally like a different between people like American people, Japanese, French. And but as I said, I need to switch a little bit of mindset to the people who pursue the financial goal and then the someone really contribution and stuff. It's also the same like to French like this, Japanese and American. We need to change a little bit like the language, not the language. It's like the mindset of communication. And then it really facilitates the communication much smoother than just keep having the stance of like being Japanese. So that's what I realized while working with a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Is that just a skill that you learned over time or is that something that you had to be more intentional about? Uh, actually, like probably I learned it while I was traveling. I traveled around like 30 countries at that, that time. I needed a lot of like help because not all of them was able to speak English. So sometimes I need to understand their gesture and everything. Also, the one of the part I really liked while traveling was not only like 
dizzy thing like a big city, but like really small city, and then I see the small street because I can see how people live in the town, and then not only like happy moment, but also I can feel their sadness as well. And whenever I felt someone's sadness, I somehow felt my sadness is gone. I actually like I can release myself because if it's like they're totally like different from me, different color, different religion, different gender and their age, still they felt the same emotion as mine, the sadness. So all my sadness all of a sudden it's gone and then only my compassion and warmth only like remain. That kind of thing is really important. So I always also trying to see my stuff's emotions sometimes, say okay or not, trying to put myself in their shoes and then I can really it's really helped me to have a good communication with them. Mm -hmm. That's such a great point. And I also enjoy just kind of wandering around when I travel, ending up in random residential areas <laughs> rather than more touristy areas, because you're very right. And I wonder if it's the same draw that we have towards reading fiction, watching movies, seeing art, just being able to connect with something that makes us all human. And I wonder if that has more to do with just not feeling alone. Yes, so true. I agree. So if someone was going to Japan for business and they really didn't have much time to learn anything about the country before coming, is there anything in particular that you would teach them or tell them to learn before they come? Yeah, especially if it's Japan, like probably they should know the best ramen in the city where they should go. But like, besides this, probably, I don't know. But uh, whenever I go somewhere, the new country, I try to know the sad history of what they have like vietnam has of course like all country have and then uh, not only the good part of the history but the sad history of the country which is i think uh, really important because how they bounce back from this uh, tragedy and they build the country this process actually became their spirit and then it's actually cultivate who they are so by understanding uh, this kind of history process actually it's kind of help us to understand who they are and have better communications and knowing nothing so that's what i'm always doing whenever i visit the country sense i haven't heard that one before but it does make a lot of sense but is there anything that comes to mind with Japan specifically that you feel would be worthwhile for people to take the time to learn about to get a better understanding of Japan? Yeah. World War II is the big turn of the event in Japan. And yet, probably, I think the process, how they de like redevelop the country after World War II is more important because they're trying to learn more about like U.S. industry and they're trying to integrate the technology into Japan, then they work really hard and then uh, take really bold action. So that's the reason why we have now the older infrastructures, we have relatively like a rich lifestyle right now, because all thanks to them. So I really want to know about not only like the overview of the history, but I really want to know the personal history of the people living in the period. So that's the reason why uh, on our system as well, like a lot of like senior citizens talking their background and how been, how they've been through and uh, all this kind of historical moment, it's really kind of helped me. Like probably I can do it more. I can learn from the history. I can probably use this mindset and experience into my uh, life I'm, I'm working right now. So yeah, I'm more like interested in the personal history. Yeah, that's great. So, Sorry, it's not the super perfect uh, answer. But. <laughs> no, but it doesn't have to be the perfect answer. It just yeah. has to add something new to the conversation, which it definitely has, and I appreciate that. So is there anything that we didn't get to talk about, anything you wish we talked about more, or anything you wish I'd asked you in this conversation? Uh, actually, no. Like uh, All the questions you gave me, and then there, it's actually somehow like clear up my mind as well and then uh, I could say all what I wanted to say. Yes. 
the problem is like I should learn English a little like more before. No, it's really hard when you haven't been using the language. Even just one week, it starts to get rusty. So I definitely understand that. <laughs> So thank you so much for sharing your time today. I will put all of the links to the relevant companies in the description of this episode. So be sure to check those out. And thanks again for sharing your time. Thank you so much for your time. I had a great time. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Be sure to check out the links in the description of this episode to learn more about Manabu and Health, as well as the Japanese language program, Sale. If you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and share it with a friend, colleague, or connection on LinkedIn to help spread the perspectives and information shared in the podcast. And please remember to go ahead and subscribe or follow on whatever platform you're using, and also leave a rating and review if you enjoy the podcast. If you would like to help support the podcast, please check out the link to the coffee page to keep me well caffeinated and making content. As always, feel free to email me at businesssuccessjapan at gmail.com if you have any other questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes or interview topics. I'd love to hear from you directly as well, so if you'd like to leave a voice message, you can find a link to do that in the description as well. But for now, remember that the more you learn, the more confident you will become as you explore all of the opportunities Japan has to offer you. Until next time, mata kondo!